Good morning. So uh, my talk this morning will be about um, my technical study on the Putuan boats. So to familiarize ourselves with the terms I'll be using, um, I'll introduce uh, the idea of plant built boats. So plant built boats, um, but hindi masyadong clear sa picture, pero they're built with individual planks. So different levels of planks. So iba siya sa mga bangkas that we normally see today in our wooden hulk vessels na um, gawa sa plywood, di ba? So these are usually made from ano, um, larger pieces of wood cut from trees. So these are examples from Indonesia and the southern Philippines, at Awi-Tawi ito. This one is Indonesia. I don't know if you can consider them boats kasi halos ano, parang ships na rin yung size nila. And they're still made today, although hindi siya ganun ka-common anymore. Tapos we have the terms balanghay, or the alternate spelling balangay, barangay, and then butuan boats, which is the focus of my study. So, for a long time, well, even up to today, um, people use these terms interchangeably. So, in uh, historical accounts, Pigafetta um, used the term balanghay, spelled with a H, to describe the larger boats of, uh, the, the first large boats that he encountered nung pumasok yung fleet ni Magellan sa Philippines, sa Philippine waters. So, yun lang yung ano, it, it is parang a general term to describe larger boats. Tapos there, there were no, uh, there was no further detailed explanation kung ano yung balangay except for its, the relation to its size, it's bigger than the other boats. Tapos we have the term barangay na sometimes uh, it's synonymous with balangay but it also refers to a specific type of uh, Tagalog flat bottom boat that was stitched. You know, it's also been um, described as a dowel and dashed lug boat with a square keel. That was the second uh, definition na yan, um, deserves uh, a bit more explanation as well. I will talk about that later. The focus of the study was on the Butuan boats. So, this refers strictly to the boats, archaeological uh, findings of uh, wooden hulled vessels found in Butuan City. So regardless of their construction and their size. So when I say Butuan boats, ito yung nakita sa uh, Butuan. Okay. Tapos, uh, we heard in the previous lecture by Dr. Lim, um, you'll see sa archival accounts terms like Kunlun Bo. So Kunlun was the Chinese word used to refer to the Austronesians or the people uh, from, from Southeast Asia. And Bo to re refers to large ships. Tapos we have um, from about 500 years ago, the introduction of different types of vessels yung hybrid or South China Sea tradition or mestizo vessels. So these refer to vessels that use construction techniques um, influenced by both Chinese and Southeast Asian uh, characteristics. So back to Southeast Asian boats. This is very relevant to the previous lecture by Dr. Lim because this is one of the one of the very good examples of our shared heritage. Uh, found throughout Southeast Asia. Um, so archival accounts, uh, which started to, um, we started to get more data nung pasok ng European colonization. So from the very beginning, uh, rebellion sa uh, Portuguese, in observation niya when he was in the Madocas said that Southeast Asian boats are made so tight that the seams are very visible. So you imagine may individual planks, halos hindi mo makita yung where one plank starts and, and the other one ends. That was more than about a hundred years later, si Alcina Naman, who was in Samar in the Philippines, said the seams between one board and the next so joined that they seem to be a single piece. That was Wallace, about 200 years later, in Eastern Indonesia then, sa Molokas said, without aid other than rude practical skill, 
it is often difficult to find a place where a knife blade can be inserted between the joints. So you can see, pare pare yung sinasabi nila. It, it, they, they, all the Europeans were very impressed sa skill sa paggawa ng, ng boats ng Southeast Asians. And we have examples here ng uh, ethnographic um, studies in Indonesia of how an idea of how they, how they did this. So, after na join yung planks uh, individually to one another, um, they would tie pieces of wood, tapos uh, using cordage, itaitan sila para maging watertight or as watertight as possible. So, how did they start doing this? Um, isang characteristic ng Southeast Asian uh, watercraft was uh, particularly sa plant-built watercraft was that they used hindi uh, masyado clear dito this is doweling so ang dowels, these are dowels ito yung mga uh, rounded uh, pieces of wood they're inserted into the keel para baka receive siya ng uh, uh, additional planks so in this example, ito yung mga naka-encircle sa red, these are dowels so these are used to join um, planks and the keel together. In some um, archaeological examples, although wala sa Philippines, this is uh, in other places in Southeast Asia, uh, in addition to doweling, lacing or sewing was also used. So, ito yung mga examples. So, additional holes were drilled into the planks para uh, matalian ng, ng fiber or rattan or another um, rope to literally sew the planks together. So, yung pagkasaw nila ng planks, uh, these holes, hindi siya uh, na-insert um, directly from one side of the plank to the other. So, parang L-shaped siya. It goes in one side, tapos gagawa sila ng additional hole on this side of the plank. So, hindi visible yung stitching from the outside. So, this is different from um, Indian Ocean tradition where na-insert yung stitching uh, all the way through the width of the plank. Now, we have another term, an introduction of another term, lashed lug boats. So, if you, I haven't been to the museum here, but uh, there's a very good model that was shown sa screens kanina about the building of a lash lug boat model. So it's very time consuming, it's a lot of carving out. Dapat very precise ang, ang construction technique mo. So it, it, it's, um, so when it's built up, the lugs are drilled with holes and these are used to lash um, additional components, kaya lash lug. So our, the oldest uh, archaeological evidence we have of lashed lug boats in the world uh, in, was found in Malaysia, Peninsular Malaysia. This is the one. And this was dated uh, by uh, C14 dating to between the 3rd and 5th century AD. Um, this is also corroborated by, using, uh, by looking at associated uh, archaeological materials. And then we have the first-hand written accounts that I mentioned earlier in the 16th, 17th, and 19th centuries. And then uh, we have examples of probably a still living tradition today. This is a picture taken of, uh, in the 1970s in, uh, in Indonesia, uh, Lamalata, uh, Indonesia. And they're practicing uh, whale hunting. But there was also a recording of the construction of these boats that also used lashed lug boats. That was in the 1970s, and then I found a recent picture. Now, it looks like still today, they're still um, maybe not as, uh, not as common anymore, but still you see a protrusion, a lug with a hole, that was lashed nylon. So that could still, we could still consider that the lashed lug tradition is still living today. So that's on over 1,500 years of this sort of tradition, of very uh, difficult, time-consuming, uh, labor-intensive boat-building tradition in Southeast Asia. And to show what's not a lash lug boat, 
uh, and this is, these are also Indonesian um, examples. So these are lugs, but they're not used for lashing, hence it's not a lash lug boat. And then you have uh, other examples of plant built boats where the frames are directly uh, fastened to the planks without the use of lugs. So that is not also a lashed lug boat. So we have uh, examples of sites. The red dots refer to uh, our archaeological sites containing lashed lug boats. The green ones um, are the, sorry, these are the green ones actually, where we have uh, ethnographic, uh, historical um, records of boat building where they describe the construction of lashed lug boats. And then here is the uh, Lamalera, where uh, the, the um, whale hunting peoples use them probably up to the day. And then we have the dates of many of them. We even have um, similar ones in Hong Kong. And by the way, even in southern Taiwan, uh, there was a recorded similar boat building tradition um, just before the Second World War. It's a very good uh, photographic evidence of that sort of relationship and, and this uh, construction and the technology traveling not just in the Southeast, e uh, Southeast Asian region but beyond. In fact, uh, even up to um, the Maldives, so that's halfway through the Indian Ocean, we have a similar uh, boat building tradition. So, we see in the earlier examples that we had doweling and placing. And then, uh, coincidentally maybe, um, from the 8th century and onwards, nawala yung examples natin of, of lacing. So it's just doweling. And then we have other examples where the wood's so degraded that we really can't tell um, if they used uh, one or the other or either. So examples throughout Southeast Asia. So you see different shapes. So here is uh, one in South Sumatra, Southern Sumatra, in the 8th century. And then this is from Bujangan uh, of Kulo, from the 15th, and 16th, 15th to 16th century based on uh, associated cargo. And then this is the most intact example that we have of a lashed lug boat that was excavated in between 2010 and 2011, uh, Punjul joined Central Java, and that was dated uh, using, uh, by radiocarbon dating, the rope fibers to um, the 7th and 8th century AD. So let's move on to the Butuan boats. Between 8 to 11 sites were reported to the National Museum, although not all of them have been confirmed by archaeological study. So seven sites were archaeologically excavated, you know, boats one, two, three, and four. Um, well, boats one, two, and three were excavated in the 1970s. Boat five was excavated in the 1980s. And then boats four and nine, which uh, are just, um, are, are very close to boats two and three, were excavated. Uh, between 2012 and 2015. Among those, yung recovery is boats 1, 2, and 5. So yung boat 1 is um, being exhibited now sa Butuan City uh, Regional, the Regional Museum of the National Museum in Butuan City. Tapos boat 2 is uh, in storage right now at our National Museum here in Manila. And boat 5 is also in storage in Butuan. And these are their pictures uh, when they were um, excavated. This is, this is a picture, a labeled picture, but I believe is of boat three. So this was not recovered, and there was very little written about it, but it looks like a different kind of flashlight boat. Unfortunately, uh, I haven't been able to find um, pictures of the excavation of boat one. Um, so why boat one? So the environment of Butuan is actually um, pretty ideal for the um, 
preservation of wooden remains. So it's waterlogged, plus they were buried under um, alluvial sediments like they. So this limits uh, deterioration. Tapos nahanap lang siya by chance, uh, but by looting activities, and these were reported to the National Museum. So in fact, yung boat one was a um, rescue archaeological project. So baka that's why there, there might not be uh, photographs of the excavation. So, um, if you know anything about the Butuan boats, or if you've tried to read on them previously, um, back in the 1970s, kasi, uh, these were radiocarbon dated. So the results of those, of the two dates that they had, came up to 320 AD, Chaka 13th century AD, so Malayo. Um, as part of my research, um, to sort of verify these two dates, that you have 900 years in between, these two boats that were found in the same region in, in a, a similar environment, um, I was able to sample seven pieces of wood from five boats. That was um, Lumabas, which I think is um, a little more. Uh, I don't know if you could say accurate, but a little bit more reliable. So the, all, the, all of the dates fall between the 8th and 10th century AD. So um, not just because they're all grouped together, but if you think of the boats all found, they were all found within a one kilometer radius of each other in the same environment at around the same depth, uh, depth of about 1.5 to 2 meters under the surface. So I think this makes a lot more sense. Um, unfortunately, we lose the old date of the 4th century, but uh, I think academically, this is something that we have to um, um, move forward with. Another um, thing that we learned by looking at the Butuan boats is previously, when you think about uh, traditional boat building, Usually, we, we think of the boat builders having this favorite wood type or favorite tree to use the boat building uh, materials. But we see in the, this is the boat one, boat two, boat five, boat four, and this is actually boat nine. Uh, I was only get, uh, able to get limited samples. We see ten uh, different family uh, species or uh, types of wood. Although not all of them are, have been identified to species level, we also have genera. So different, 10 different types of wood. That's for the planks, we have five different types of wood used for planks. So this means, uh, a few, could mean a few things. Could mean that uh, the Southeast Asian region, uh, by the way, uh, almost all of these are available throughout island Southeast Asia and the Philippines. Um, there was just a, uh, we had a good availability of woods that were um, ideal for boat building. Another thing that we learned uh, about traditional boat building in the Philippines, when we say, look, think of traditional, inisip natin yung parang unchanging. You have this tradition, so you keep using it. Pero looking at these, uh, these are the keels of the boats. So even up to today, the keel is the most important part of the ship or the boat, because that's the first piece of the vessel that's, that's laid, right? But if you look at the keel of boat one, boat two, boat three, and boat four, boat five, they all use different designs, and we don't quite understand why. Like a personal preference of the boat builder, it might be their signature, it might be a technical uh, explanation that we haven't, we don't quite understand yet. Pero, you see within one technical tradition, you see a lot of variation. So that's something that we need to explore. And even today, you can see that with the uh, boat builders uh, now. You can see, when you say bangka, you have an idea in your mind. But when you look more closely at the boat building traditions now, you see variations. And that's something that we need to look at before, uh, before they completely disappear. So here's another uh, look at the lugs and lashing holes. So if you just look at them uh, very quickly, they look similar. 
that are actually all very different. So, uh, in both 1 and 5, di siya masyadong clear, but in addition to the dowels, they used wooden pegs that were drilled through para malak yung dowels. So that prevents the plants from sliding. Sliding, um, yeah. And again, if you compare the other boats, same, same, but different. So, if you look closely enough, and na memorize nyo yan, you could uh, recognize actually which boat one boat you're looking at without looking at the labels, if, if you just memorize uh, these sorts of patterns. So, maganda siyang study for the OC <laughs> sa inyo. Now, the lashing pattern that, that we uh, that, that I show here, we, I actually don't know. Kasi in the archaeological record, yung ropes, kasi they don't survive very well, even in, uh, um, in the muddy environment. So these are based on ethnographic examples. So these are in the uh, Indonesian Pacific. So these are actual uh, drawings from, from examples in Indonesia. But the Punjal Harja boat, which I talked about earlier, the one that's the most intact flash dog boat in, in um, Southeast Asia, shows a different example. So in these examples, you have one lug in one plant, tapos yung lashing niya is just confined to that. So each individual plant has a lashing. But here you have, this is one plant, and this is another plant, and then you will have the lashing that connects these together. So in fact, the lashing is also used as a primary um, a, a primary plant fastening. I may have jumped too far because I, I forgot to mention, while boats 1 and 5 have the locking uh, pegs, boats 2 and 4, we haven't been able to find examples of these. So that means these would be more prone to the planks separating from each other. So maybe this is another technique for securing the planks and keeping them from, um, from separating. So, another characteristic of the Butuan boats that we found is, um, I'll step back first. So, in, in conventional uh, wooden boat building, the building sequence is you have the keel, the keel piece, and then you attach the stem and the stern posts, and then you attach uh, the planks. This is traditional boat building. So in traditional boat building, you have the shell first. And this is actually even up to today. If, um, if you look at wooden boat building now, and even modern boat building, you have the keel, the stem post, and then the frames, and then the, the planks would be the last. Where in fact, uh, here, you have the the planks first, or the shell first, until your boat is built up, and then the frames are inserted afterwards. So, so both the one boats, we don't have the stem and the stern post. What we have are uh, what are referred to as wing ends. So, these are connected to the keel of the boat. In fact, this may be the keel of boat too. And then you have this structure, na parang triangular shell na structure. And Maybe this is a bit more clear from the Indonesian example. So this is very different from uh, traditional boat building uh, in the rest of the world. And it's, you also see ethnographic examples up to the 20th century, where in Indonesia, uh, stem and stern posts weren't used. So you, these are stemless boats. So in some cases, may parang wing end na, na structure, and in other cases, the plants are just joined towards the end to meet together. And these are actually from the Pacific. So you see a joining of, of different technologies in, in boat building. And here's the uh, hypothetical um, reconstruction of how the wing end was used in the Butuan boat too. So, if the thing that survived this is the piece that survived in Butuan boat too, but this is the reconstruction how we think they may have joined to the rest of the planks until you have the top of the 
the top of the hull. Um, we're getting towards the end. So what do these boats look like? These are archaeological examples we don't know, but from iconography and from drawings, uh, we, we can only assume. So these are the uh, these are relief um, uh, sculptures from Borobudur in Indonesia, dated to the 9th century. And you can see here a tripod mast uh, and sails and outriggers, and then a drawing uh, in 1613 of uh, a jong, not a junk, a jong, but this is an Indonesian boat showing uh, quarter rudders. So instead of the axial rudder uh, at the center, at the back of the boat, you have quarter rudder and sometimes two on the other side. In this case, you have um, single masts instead of the tripod masts you find in Borobudur. And uh, I guess I'll close with that. Thank you very much.